In his book entitled God's Unexpected Opportunities, author Joe Stoll makes the statement, he says, limited information always leads to limited conclusions. In other words, if you don't have enough information, then you are going to make the wrong conclusion. And to illustrate his point that incomplete information leads to a faulty conclusion, Stoll tells the story of a Texas rancher who was in Germany on an agri... agri uh, I'll get the word correct. <laughs> agricultural consulting tour. He said, stopping by a small farm, the Texan asked the German farmer how big his place was. Oh, the farmer said, it's, it's not real big. It's about a mile this way and a mile that way and a mile this way. Turning to the Texas rancher, the German asked, and how big is your place? Well, the Texas rancher said, I don't know how to tell you this, but if you get in my pickup truck when the sun comes up, and if you drive all day long when the sun goes down, he said, and I do that, I'm still on my ranch. To which the German farmer smiled, he nodded his head, and he said, oh, I know, I had a pickup truck like that once myself. <laughs> so, you see, limited information really does lead to a faulty conclusion. But that's not really very serious. It's, it's not much of a problem when you're talking about farms and pickup trucks and you don't get it all correct. However, it can be eternally tragic to make a faulty conclusion about Christianity based on limited information, especially as it pertains to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's because according to the New Testament, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, without doubt, the foundation of Christianity. Remove the resurrection and folks, there is no Christian faith. The Apostle Paul recognized this, and he spoke, and he wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 14. And if you don't have your Bibles here, you can just look on the screen. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, if we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And you're still in your sins. And those who also have fallen asleep, meaning who died in Christ, they've perished, Paul said. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be most pitied. And Paul said that if Christ's resurrection is not true, then our faith, if you do have faith in Christ, it's worthless because you're still in your unforgiven sin. And those who have died believing that they're saved and that they were on their way to heaven, he said, they're now in hell. Therefore, he said, if that's the case, we are men and women to be most pitied because we have banked our eternal destiny on a lie. But the good news is that the resurrection of Christ is absolutely true. It really did happen. And yet, there are many people today who continue to reject Christianity in part because they do not have the right information about Jesus being raised from the dead. And so they've wrongly concluded that Christianity is just, well, it's just false because they think that the resurrection is a hoax. It's a made-up story. It's a, as Peter put it, a cunningly devised fable, a myth concocted by Christ's desperate disciples. And if one makes those kinds of assumptions based upon faulty and limited information about the resurrection of Jesus, they will conclude, they'll conclude that there's nothing to the Bible. There's nothing to the message of salvation in Christ. It's just nonsense. This is precisely why the early church went to great lengths to emphasize Christ's resurrection. For example, Peter emphasized on the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon by an apostle, Jesus, uh, the apostles of Jesus. Peter said this in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. He said, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you 
by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death but God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And the Apostle Paul, his very first, very first sermon as a newly converted Christian missionary, delivered this message in a synagogue service. He also spoke of the resurrection of Jesus. Here's what Paul said, Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 29. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, meaning Christ, they took him down from the cross and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. Now, we should understand something very important about the New Testament writers and preachers. Those witnesses to the people, as Paul puts it, when it came to the resurrection of Christ, these witnesses did not merely preach that the Lord was raised from the dead. I mean, they did that, but they didn't stop there. They also, note this, they gave tangible reasons for believing that this was true, that the resurrection of Christ was not a hoax. Therefore, this morning, being Easter Sunday, I want us to take a, a little break this week from our study of the Gospel of Luke to look at the way one of these witnesses, another Gospel writer by the name of Mark, how he gives his account of Christ's resurrection. Because based on the way Mark writes about the resurrection, it is obvious, it is obvious that his intention is to give, a, uh, to give us complete assurance and absolute certainty that this event took place. You see, Mark, like all the other gospel writers, he had a specific purpose in mind in presenting the life and the ministry of Christ. He wanted, note this, he wanted his unbelieving readers to become believers in Jesus Christ. And so when it came to the event of Christ's resurrection, Mark was very careful to present it in a way that would help convince his readers, that Jesus really was alive. And the way Mark does this, folks, is by laying out for us three specific reasons for believing with absolute certainty that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now, as I just mentioned, Mark's purpose in doing this, in presenting certain issues related to the resurrection of Christ, his purpose was evangelistic. That is to say that he wanted to help non-Christians see clear evidence for the resurrection so that they would become Christians. So if you are, are not a true Christian, and by true Christian I mean one who has repented of their sin, placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, if you are not a true Christian, and you're just not sure if Christ was raised from the dead, you're here in church, this is the thing to do on Easter, but you're not really convinced. You don't know if Christ has really been raised from the dead or not. This morning, you're going to see, you're going to read, you're going to be presented with some very strong arguments and reasons to believe that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead. And he calls you, therefore, to believe in him as your Savior and as your Lord. But if you already are a believer, then the study also is going to benefit you because it will simply strengthen your faith. It, it will uh, give you greater confidence that what you have believed is absolutely true. You don't need to have any doubts about it. And it will encourage you by reminding you that Jesus Christ is alive and he is vitally involved in your life and he has every right to be vitally involved in your life because he is your Lord and Master. This is precisely what Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verse 9, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. He died, he rose again, that he might be your Lord. And so as we get into our text this morning, we see that the first reason Mark gives for believing with certainty that Christ was raised from the dead is simply this, the stone was rolled away. 
We break in at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, they bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Now, when Mark closed chapter 15 of his gospel account, it was late Friday afternoon. Jesus had died at 3 in the afternoon, 3 p.m., and a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, though a member of the high Jewish council that was responsible for his death, Joseph was rushing to, to bury the Lord before the sun went down and the Sabbath began. Now remember, in Jewish thinking, the day begins at night, sundown. Therefore, Friday night was the beginning of the Sabbath. Not Saturday morning, but Friday night. Now notice what we read looking back at the end of Mark chapter 15, verses 42 and 43. When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, in ancient times, Jewish people did not work on the Sabbath. In fact, for the most part, that is still true in Israel today. So the task then of burying Jesus had to take place quickly before the Sabbath began. The part of the evening that had already uh, had come was really what we would call today late afternoon. So work could still be done until sundown, and then the Sabbath would begin when all work would cease. But the sun would be setting soon. It hadn't yet, and they had to rush with burial preparations. Therefore, we read... In chapter 15, verse 46, we're just going back to bring it up to where we are now. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Now, this verse speaks of several activities following Christ's recent death. Namely, the cross of Jesus being lowered and laid on the grounds, uh, on the ground, the nails then pulled out from his wrists and feet, and the ropes unloosed. Joseph of Arimathea then wrapped the body of Jesus in a clean linen cloth, and according to John's gospel, with the help of a man by the name of Nicodemus, another disciple from the Jewish high council, they quickly then carried the Lord to a tomb where they prepared his body to be buried by enclosing it in linen wrappings with spices. Then they placed his body in the tomb, and finally they rolled a large stone to cover the entrance to the tomb. Now we'll take a closer look at this stone in just a, a few minutes, but first I want you to notice the very last verse of Mark chapter 15. It's verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, were looking on to see where he was laid. Now, the question is, who were these women? Well, going back to Mark's gospel, we read in chapter 15, verses 40 and 41, there were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene the Mary, and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and Joses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him, and there were many other women who came up with him. To, they were amongst the many women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So these women, we learn, they were followers of Christ from the Galilee area in Israel, in, which is the northern region, and they had followed him to Jerusalem, and they sadly watched their Lord and their master be killed, and now... Now they had observed where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had buried him, had laid him in the tomb. But at this point, there was nothing left for them to do because the Sabbath was coming and they simply did not and would not work on the Sabbath. So apparently, they left the tomb and they went back to wherever they were staying in the Jerusalem area. And that's how chapter 15 ends, with these women... <coughs> seeing where Joseph and Nicodemus had placed the body of Jesus. However, with the opening of chapter 16, it's now Sunday. It's very early Sunday morning. The Sabbath is over, and these same women have ventured out to purchase some spices. You see, on Saturday 
evening after sunset, which officially ends the Sabbath when the Jewish people see some stars at night come out, the Sabbath is over. Uh, the shops then would be open for a few hours of business. And by the way, that is still true in the country of Israel today. Now, why did these women buy spices? Well, Mark tells us in the opening verse of chapter 16, right at the end, that they might come and anoint him. You see, even though Christ's body had already been anointed by Joseph and by Nicodemus with some spices and perfumes in order to add fragrance to cover the stench of decay, these women still wanted to personally anoint Christ with more spices. The question again is, well, why do that? He's already been anointed. Well, they did that just because they loved him. And this was to be their final act of devotion to him. This was to be their last tribute of love and friendship to their fallen leader. You see, they were not expecting him to be resurrected. And so they have come to say their final farewell and to offer their last gesture of love to Jesus. And so we read in verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Now, these ladies were so eager to perform this last service to Jesus that very early on Sunday morning, they came to the tomb, arri uh, arriving here soon after sunrise. It's very possible that they left before the sun had risen. It was still dark out. And they came there in order to anoint the body of Jesus. But as they neared the tomb, notice that something occurred to them which they had not thought of before. Verse 3, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now, in their zeal, in their passion, in their eagerness to anoint the body of Jesus, these women had overlooked the fact that a stone had been rolled to cover the entrance of the tomb. And they certainly knew that they were not strong enough to remove the stone. You see, according to Matthew's gospel, and even says here in Mark's gospel, this was a large stone. One Bible scholar explained this about the stones that were used to cover tombs in those days. He said the tomb was sealed shut with a circular flat stone, that, in other words, a disc or, or a rock, that rolled down a sloping groove till it was securely in front of the entrance to keep out intruders. To roll that stone back up again would require the strength of several men. In fact, one authority I read suggested that it would take about 20 men who could roll this stone away. That's how heavy it was. That's how large it was. And that's why these women were so, were so concerned, because they knew they certainly couldn't move the stone. So how could they then enter the tomb to anoint Christ's body? Well, notice what happened next. Verse 4. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Now, Mark tells us that as these women were walking and talking, apparently with their heads down, they came, as they came upon the tomb and looking up then, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. So the natural question to ask folks at this point is, who moved the stone? Many years ago, an English journalist by the name of Frank Morrison set out to prove that the story about Christ's resurrection was a myth. However, in the process of doing his investigation, Morrison became convinced of Christ's resurrection, and he wrote a book about it. You know what he named the book? Who Moved the Stone? In his book, Frank Morrison wrote these very significant words. He said, the stone is the one silent an infallible witness in the whole episode. Let me read that again. The stone is the one silent and infallible witness in the whole episode. Now, why is the stone such an important witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, because if some unknown group had rolled away the stone, it is very likely that they also removed the body of Jesus and pretended that he rose again. So who could possibly have rolled the stone away? Well, here are some of the possibilities that have been suggested over the years. First of all, some have thought that, well, perhaps Joseph of Arimathea, that he moved the stone. However, 
the stone was so large that it would have taken several men to roll it up that groove. But let's just say for the sake of argument that Joseph did enlist some unbelieving people to help him move the stone and remove Christ's body from the tomb. If that was the case, and certainly later, when people started believing that Christ rose from the dead, one of these unbelievers would certainly have exposed it as a hoax and admitted that they did it. But you know what? No one ever came forward. No one ever, ever came forward and said that they were part of such a scheme. In all of history, no one ever came forward and said, I'm a part of this scheme. It's all a, it's all a joke. And what if it was a group of believers? A group of believers in Jesus that Joseph enlisted. Not unbelievers, but maybe he got some believers. Well, then they certainly later on would have endured great persecution for the sake of something that they knew to be untrue. And we can eliminate that. Because nobody, nobody endures persecution for something they know is, is false. We might endure it, and we do endure it for what we believe to be true, but not when you know it's false. So you have to eliminate that theory too, the theory that Joseph of Arimathea, with the help of others, when they, whether they were unbelievers or believers, rolled away the stone. Now, there are others who then suggest that perhaps it was the Lord's disciples who rolled the stone away, and they removed his body. But that doesn't make sense either. It doesn't make any sense because the New Testament presents these men as too scared at this time, too intimidated, too fearful to do anything that would have interfered with the Roman authorities. They were terrified of the Roman authorities. Remember, these men, all of them, they fled the scene when Jesus was arrested. All of them. They weren't about to take on the Roman soldiers, but that is exactly what they would have had to have done if they rolled the stone away and removed Christ's body. And let me show you what I mean. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 62, we read this. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered together with, with Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He's, he has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, meaning I'm giving some soldiers to the tomb area. Go, make it as secure as you know. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now, the seal was probably... A thread stretched over the, over the stone and sealed at each end. To remove the stone then would mean breaking the seal and as a result incurring the wrath of the Roman Empire. You see, it was a capital crime. Note that. It was a capital crime to tamper with a Roman seal. And the penalty wasn't just death. It was death by crucifixion upside down. You don't mess with the Roman Empire and their seals of authenticity. Now, at this point in their lives, it would have been completely out of character for the Lord's disciples to do anything as courageous as this. As I said, these were fearful men at this point, intimidated men. These men were hiding behind closed doors in the city of Jerusalem, just terribly frightened and afraid of the Jewish authorities, that they were going to burst into the room and arrest them at any moment. And here's something else that's important to know. In Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 11, we read this. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard, this is after the resurrection, some of the guard, the soldiers, the Pilate stationed at the tomb. Some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, well, we'll win him over and, and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread amongst the Jews and is to this day. Now, what we read here is that after Christ's resurrection, some of the soldiers who had been guarding the tomb, they returned to the city 
of Jerusalem and told the Jewish leaders what had happened. And these men then gave, the Jewish leaders gave the soldiers some money to just buy them off and concoct a lie, instructing them to say that Christ's disciples came at night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. Now, folks, this is such a ridiculous argument and falsehood that Matthew, notice, Matthew doesn't even bother to refute it. It's silly, and I'll tell you why. It's because what judge would believe you if you said, well, while I was asleep, my neighbor broke into my house and he robbed my television? Who knows what goes on while you're asleep? That's the point. You're asleep. You don't know what's going on. No one. This is, this is silly. So if the stone wasn't rolled away by Joseph of Arimathea or Christ's disciples, then some have suggested, well, perhaps it was the Roman soldiers who removed the body. Well, that doesn't make any sense either for two reasons. Number one, it wasn't legal. It wasn't legal to break the seal of a tomb. They would have had, they would have been, a soldier would have been executed like anybody else if he had done this. So they didn't, they weren't going to do this. Secondly, if they had removed Christ's body, then once his disciples started preaching about Christ's resurrection from the dead and people started believing it, all they would have had to do was come forward to squash such apparent nonsense by marching into Jerusalem, holding up the body of Jesus, saying, it's not true. Here it is. We stole it. We have it. But they didn't do that because they did not have his body. So if none of these men were responsible for rolling away the stone and taking the body of Jesus out of the tomb, then the question again is, who then did move the stone? Because when the women arrived at the tomb, the stone had been rolled away. Well, Mark doesn't tell us who rolled the stone away, but another gospel writer, Matthew does. Joel read this earlier, Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 through 4. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook, <coughs> excuse me, for fear of him, and became like dead men. Now notice, Matthew tells us that there was an earthquake sent by God. It was probably a very local earthquake, just around the tomb area, and that an angel at that point descended from heaven. And he, this angel, he rolled the stone away. But why? Why did this angel roll the large stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Listen closely. He rolled it away so that the women could look into the tomb and could see that Jesus was not there. You see, no human, no human being actually saw Jesus rise from the dead. People saw him after he rose, but no one witnessed the actual resurrection in real time. Jesus rose perhaps at the very moment of the earthquake and then walked through the walls of the tomb. You remember, the, the stone was only rolled away to let the women look in, not to let Jesus out. He didn't need that because in his glorified, resurrected body, Jesus was now capable of walking through material objects, which he did. He did later that evening when the disciples were behind locked doors in the city of Jerusalem in a, in a room there, the upper room, and he just stood in their midst. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't open the door. He walked through the door, and he said, Shalom Aleichem, which means peace be unto you. Now, folks, in telling us all of this, Mark has a point. Mark is making a point. His point being that the entrance to the tomb was open for the sake of convincing the women that Jesus had risen from the dead. And, and that's why this event is recorded for us in Scripture. It is to convince you. It is to convince you that Jesus has really been raised from the dead. So are you convinced that this actually happened? You should be. You should absolutely be because there's no other reasonable explanation for the stone being rolled away other than the angel did it. As we've already seen, it makes absolutely no sense to believe that some group of men rolled the stone away and removed Christ, Christ's body. Christ rose from the dead early that Sunday morning, 
walked through the walls of the tomb, and the angel rolled the stone away to let the women look in. And what did they find when they looked inside? Well, that question brings us to the second reason that Mark gives for believing with certainty that Jesus rose from the dead. The stone, number one, the stone was rolled away, and it was rolled away by an angel. Number two, the tomb was empty. Verse 5, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. Since the entrance to the tomb was now open, well, the women were able to go inside and look around. And doing so, they found the young man sitting there. So who was this young man? Well, this was the angel who had rolled the stone away. Now, I realize that Mark refers to him as a young man, but he does that because this is how the angel appeared to the women, as a young man. However, Matthew tells us very clearly that he was an angel. In fact, both Luke and John, in their gospel narratives, they say that there were two angels, but Mark only concentrates on one of them, probably because this angel was the spokesman. Now, if you saw an angel, or two, dressed in white robes, dazzling apparel, as Luke tells us, and their appearance like lightning, as Matthew tells us, think about how you would react. Well, Mark tells us that at the end of verse 5, that the women, he says, were amazed, which means that they were overwhelmed with emotion. In fact, this particular Greek word carries with it the various reactions of fear, of distress, of terror, of awe. In other words, the thought is, these poor women were terrified. So one of the angels speaks in order to just calm them down. Verse 6, he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, meaning he's from Nazareth, who has been crucified. He's risen. He's not here. Behold, here's the place where they laid him. Now the angel tells them not to be afraid because the one they are looking for, Jesus from the town of Nazareth, who was crucified, he isn't here. You're looking for him, but he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Now, folks, this simple statement, he is risen, is the greatest announcement of the greatest miracle that has ever occurred in all of history. You see, the theological significance of Christ's resurrection, which the rest of the New Testament explains and clarifies, is that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead because, watch this, he was totally, God the Father was totally satisfied with Christ's death as payment for the sins of sinners like us. Totally satisfied. Here's what we read in Romans chapter 4. Starting in verse 22, the Apostle Paul explains this theologically to us. He says, therefore, it was also credited to him, that is Abraham he's talking about, as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Well, let me explain this. Paul's referring to the Old Testament character, the patriarch, Abraham, who he says he was credited with divine righteousness because he believed God. Paul says that those then who believe in Christ's death and resurrection are likewise credited with divine righteousness. That's what justification means. It is the declaration by God that we are legally right. We who believe in Christ are legally righteous in his sight because he has imputed, which means he's credited or placed on our account, Christ's perfect righteousness of obedience to the law. He's given that when you believe in him. We have no righteousness of our own. None at all. If we're going to go to heaven, we not only need our sins forgiven, we need Christ's righteousness on our record because all that's on our record is disobedience, disobedience, disobedience. Christ perfectly obeyed the Mosaic law and then God the Father transferred legally his righteousness to our account the moment you believe in Christ. You need forgiveness of sins. You need his righteousness on your record. See, in the death of Jesus Christ, God the Father displayed his perfect righteousness 
justice because sin was paid for and therefore his justice was completely satisfied and the resurrection of Christ watch this it proved it proved that God had accepted and was satisfied with the sacrifice of his son and because of that he is able then he chooses then out of his mercy to justify or declare those sinners who believe in Jesus as legally righteous it doesn't mean we always behave righteously but it does mean as far as God sees us we are legally just as righteous as Jesus Christ that is the grace of God let me let me explain further and I want you to listen very closely because folks this is the heart of the gospel message. When you hear people say, well, the gospel of Christ, what I'm about to tell you, this is the heart of it. You see, sin, of which we are all sinners, sin separates us from God. Separates us from God. Why? Because God is perfectly holy, and therefore he cannot have fellowship. He cannot have a relationship with those who have sin on their record. And that means all of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And his holiness, and and this is the problem for us. He's holy, we're not. But his holiness demands justice. God can't let us get away with sin. He won't let us get away with sin. His holiness demands justice in the form of severe punishment, eternal punishment for our sins, which the Bible refers to as eternal judgment in hell. Hell is where those who have never trusted Christ are sent and they are they are trying to pay off the debt of their sin forever and ever, and they'll never do it because their sin is infinite in light of the infinite God and his righteousness. But Christ's death, this is the good news, Christ's death was a substitutionary punishment for sin in that he was judged in the place of sinners. He took their place for sins that they had committed, and he hadn't because he was innocent, pure, undeserving of punishment and his resurrection proves that God the Father accepted Christ's substitutionary sacrifice and therefore that his justice was perfectly satisfied in the death of his son God the Son listen the resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical to the gospel message it's not an add-on It's at the heart of it. And it is critical that we believe that he really rose from the dead. And it was critical that the women at the tomb, uh, that they be convinced of Christ's resurrection. And, And so notice what the angel does. He goes the extra mile to assure these women that Jesus really was raised from a real death. Notice what he says at the end of verse six. He says, behold, here's the place where they laid him. Now, what this means is that the angel then points to the slot cut out of the rock where the body of Jesus had been placed. And he says, look for yourselves, ladies. The tomb is empty. Look over there. His body is not there. He's risen. And 2,000 years later, the empty tomb still assures us of Christ's resurrection. So the next time someone tells you that they just don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, then ask them, well, what what happened to the body of Jesus? Why was the tomb empty? And if they say, well, someone or some group removed Christ's body, then just ask them how how that was even possible. Since unbelievers never produced his body, and the believers of that day were persecuted and died for the truth of the resurrection, and they certainly would not have done that if they knew it to be a hoax, just ask them that. Now, so far, Mark has given us two reasons for believing with absolute certainty and assurance that Christ was raised from the dead. The stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. But there's a third reason that Mark gives for believing with certainty in the resurrection of Christ, and that is the Lord appeared to his disciples. The Lord appeared to his disciples. As we continue looking at Mark 16, we see that not only did the angel tell the women about Christ's resurrection, but he also had a message for them to take to his apostles. Notice verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee, there you'll see him just as he told you. Now this is really quite a thoughtful and a very considerate message from the Lord to his hurting disciples, because at this point they were deeply hurt, they thought that Jesus had died And uh, they were grieving, and the Lord doesn't want, out of his compassionate heart, doesn't want them to grieve. He wants them to know that he'll meet them in northern Israel, 
in the place known, as I've said, the Galilee. Now, this was not new information. They actually should have known this, but they didn't remember it because this is what Jesus had told them on the night that he was arrested, just before being arrested. We read these words in Mark 14, starting in verse 27. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And here's a part that often we forget. And they all were saying the same thing also. In spite of all their bravado, all of them did flee. They ran away. And Peter did deny Jesus. But instead of rebuking them for their lack of, of faith, the Lord gave them a message of hope, a message of assurance that he would see them again in Galilee. All of them, including Peter, who denied him. So how do we know today that Jesus is alive when we cannot physically see him. Well, we know he's alive because the men who did see him, they told us that he appeared to them, not once, but many, many times between the time of his resurrection and the time of his ascension back to heaven, which was about 40 days. That's what the book of Acts tells us. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, the apostle Paul presents these appearances of Jesus as an argument to defend the resurrection. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, meaning some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, born he appeared to, to me also. Paul means on the road to Damascus when he was converted, Jesus appeared to him. Now, how can these... How, how can these appearances be explained away? Well, they can't. But that hasn't prevented some from trying because unbelief will go to any length to try to do stuff like this. There have been those who have speculated that Christ's disciples suffered from, they say, hallucinations in that they just thought that they saw Jesus because they were so emotionally distraught, but they didn't see him at all. They just thought that they saw him hallucinating. Now, it is possible that an individual can hallucinate and imagine he's something, he sees something that's not real. That is possible, but what's not possible is 500 people at the same time having the same hallucination. That is not possible. It's beyond the realm of possibility. And besides, people who are prone to hallucinate, they have these hallucinations because they so intently want something to be real that they imagine it is real. But the people who saw Christ, they all believed that he was dead. They had to be persuaded that he was alive. I'm thinking of not just the disciples in general, but in particular, the man we call Doubting Thomas. He, he didn't really want to believe. And then there's Mary Magdalene and then all the other disciples. So though Again, let me say, though we are not able to physically see Jesus today, why? Because, well, he's in heaven, and we're here. We still know he's alive because eyewitnesses have told us that they saw him. Verse 8 says this of Matthew 16. They went out, speaking of the women, and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, what we're being told here is that after the angels spoke to the women, they left the tomb area speechless with fear, as well as I would assume some joy as they ran to tell the men about Christ's resurrection. And these men, being the apostles, the men they went and told, they've written down, note this, they have written down in God's inspired words, specifically the New Testament, that they actually saw Jesus Christ alive after he was dead. 
Now, you and I are not going to see Jesus until we get to heaven. Peter, in his first letter, he even makes that point saying, though, though you see him not, yet you love him. Peter recognizes that. We're not seeing him now. But if we can't see him, and those who were eyewitnesses, if they died years ago, and we, therefore we can't speak to them, no one's speaking to Peter, no one's speaking to Paul, no one's speaking to John, then why should we believe that he rose from the dead? Well, the answer to that question, for that answer, we turn to John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Why should we believe? We can't see him. Why do we believe this? But Thomas, this is doubting Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst. Remember, he doesn't knock on the doors now. He just walks through and he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, by the way, what Thomas is about to say is the high point, the crescendo of the gospel of John, which is all about the deity of Christ. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Now watch this. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Folks, that's us. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, John says, many other signs, meaning miracles, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, John has collected some miracles of Christ, including the resurrection. That's a miracle, the greatest miracle. But there were many other miracles Jesus did that John did not record. So then he says in verse 31, but these have been written, these miracles I'm writing about, including the resurrection, so that you, you who have never seen Christ, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You see, we are called to believe in Jesus Christ because those who saw the resurrected Christ many, many times, they have written about this in the Word of God. We, folks, we have a reasonable faith. It's based on credible evidence, the credible evidence of a stone that was rolled away, an empty tomb, and the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to the men who have told us about them, written down in the New Testament. So, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? You'd absolutely be foolish to not believe this. The question then is, are you ready to open your heart to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? You see, the evidence for his resurrection, it is overwhelming. It's actually irrefutable. The stone really was rolled away. The tomb was empty. The Lord did appear to the disciples. But it takes more. It takes more than sound evidence for someone to come to Christ for salvation. Because this is not merely an intellectual issue. If it were, then you could just argue someone intellectually into the kingdom of God. Can't be done. It's a spiritual issue. It's an issue of the heart. You must first see your need for Christ before coming to him. You must see the truth about God. What truth? The fact that God is infinitely holy and therefore he must punish sin. God cannot let sin go escaped, uh, escaped and unpunished or else he, he would not be God. God by his nature is holy and therefore his holiness demands punishment. And then you must see the truth about yourself. You are not holy. I am not holy. We're sinful. We deserve to be punished because God is holy and he has declared that. We deserve punishment. And then you must see the truth about Christ, Jesus Christ, who is God and became a man, the God-man, that out of his infinite love for you, he laid down his life 
so that the Father would punish him instead of sinners like us. And when you see all of this, and you are convicted of your sin, not not simply persuaded you're a sinner, but convicted, you feel bad about your your sin, so bad that you're ready to turn from your your sin of of self-centeredness and self-absorption and living as if you're the center of the universe, and you turn from your sin and you turn to Jesus Christ and place your trust in Him alone for your salvation as the only basis of going to heaven not Christ and church, not Christ and good deeds, not Christ and baptism, but Christ alone, his death on the cross alone. You place your trust in Christ and his death alone for your salvation. The Bible then says that God forgives all of your sins, all of them, past, present, and future, and he imputes to you the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've never trusted Christ, what better day to do that than today? Easter Sunday, 2022. I urge you to do that. But if you already do know Christ, then be be strengthened in your faith. Be confident in this truth. Jesus really did rise from the dead, and he is alive, and he is active in your life, so make sure you do not resist his lordship in your life, but you give him free reign to rule over every area, every facet of of your life, nothing short of what scripture teaches, because I read again to you as we close, Romans chapter 14, 7 through 9, for not one of us lives for himself, Paul said to these believers at Rome, and not one dies for himself, for if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord, therefore whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now, if you would like to speak to one of our pastors about anything that you've heard today, I'm going to ask some of our pastors to come up after the service as we close, and we'll be available right up here to talk to you. But let's join our hearts in prayer. Father, indeed, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, thank you for giving us such solid reasons to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I, I realize, Lord, this is not simply an intellectual issue. Uh, I thank you for the evidence. I thank you for the credible evidence. I thank you that it's solid. It is irrefutable. But this is not an intellectual issue. This is an issue of the heart. This is an issue of you dealing in people's lives and drawing them to yourself. So we pray to that end. We pray that there would be some who today would call upon you to be their savior, for you to take uh, residence up in, in their lives as they turn their lives over to you and trust you for their eternal destiny. And I pray for those precious believers who are here that you will strengthen them in their faith. And I pray that all who know you will live to your glory, having crowned you as Lord over every area of their life. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for coming. You are dismissed.